for our friend David here. And we'll be asking for a couple of questions maybe because David, together with CSD, has been in this part of the region for the past six years. And uh, no, David learned a lot of the culture of our people here, particularly in the province of Sulu and the Arab region. David, uh, you know how to speak Palosun today? No, no, that's it. No, I don't. How about the Tagalog or the No, no, I, 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 I don't. I, you know, I, my, I try to maintain a low profile. I try to stay behind the scenes. Um, to me, the idea is to support the, the Filipinos, the Taosik, uh, to support them to be out in front. They're the ones that need to take the responsibility. If I get out in front and I'm there negotiating, one, I don't know the culture and the context as well as they do. Two, I'm a foreigner. And three, I think that at the end of the day, it's a lot more sustainable and a lot more effective if they're the ones taking the lead on this. Because they're, they're the ones that, yeah, they're the ones that are responsible for the, the front line. Yeah, they're the ones that are responsible for the, the process and the outcome. And they're going to have to be the ones that live with it. So I, uh, I try to stay very much behind the scenes and support these efforts. Yeah. But we see a lot of local capacities here already, and I think they've always been here. It's just a matter of providing the space for them. But in the, the way we addressed uh, this things here, uh, it's mostly taking the first part to go over the channel and see that the team was there. That's right. That's right. I think we're, we're, uh, yeah, that was one of the more, that was one of the more colorful yeah. incidents that we were involved in. Yes, I remember I received a call uh, from Ramin Nair, he was our guy on the ground here at the time in Sulu. He was concerned already that day that there was going to be something happening this evening forewarned. And he was told that, in fact, later that day that um, the MI, MNLF units there, the Ustad Tabar Malik, was not going to let General uh, Dolofino and Under Secretary Ramon Santos and um, I'll remember the uh, name of King Collins of Well, I, I thought it was complicated because the MILF, yeah, I'm sorry, the MNLF was demanding the agreement for tripartite meeting, which hadn't yet existed. And the intent to review the 1996 agreement. And there had been some complications in trying to get some agreement on that. So I didn't think that these were the right tactics to use. Uh, to come up with the uh, agreement on when the date should be for that tripartite meeting. But uh, nonetheless, it was a very difficult situation, and we knew that if we didn't act fast, that this would become much more complicated. At this point, it was simply, we could phrase it as a misunderstanding, or as a sleepover, or as entertainment, but we were saying to the MILF, if this goes into tomorrow, then it's going to be a, 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 a kidnapping. It's going to be something much more serious. We we're not going to be able to stop the military from going in there and trying to exert their efforts. But we hope the MLF are going to know some kind of... The MLF, yeah. Well, yeah. well, I spoke to the OIC, <laughs> and, uh, and they understood the magnitude of it. And so we got a letter from them, they sent it to us, brought it down to uh, Ustad Tabar Malik, and he waved it in the air and said, okay, there's agreement on a date for a tripartite meeting. And they, there was, it turned out there was a tripartite meeting. General Dolphin was like, go, oh, it means it blew over. But it was almost a potential catastrophe. With Umbra Kato also, the other man, the Amanda, for the final square, like the area, the recent process? No, I don't think so. I think that's, obviously it's not a good thing. Um, but I think what you are seeing now is that the MILF has made some very tough choices and they've clearly communicated this to their to their rank and file. And I think in any in any peace process, certainly all those that I've been involved in, as they get closer to an agreement, you'll often see a splintering in the ranks as they begin to make the tough choices. And I think that what this says on a, on a positive way is that indeed the MILF is making those tough choices already. Yeah. And that's important. They've made it clear they've dropped independence and obviously Kato had a problem with that. And they're also trying to instill discipline in their ranks, and he's someone who I guess has been rather that difficult. Discipline. Yeah. Well, it's easy, uh, you know, it's, 
And sometimes it's easy to be a rebel force without negotiating. When you're not negotiating or when there's little to negotiate or little progress in negotiations, certainly nothing in substance, then sometimes it's easier to be unified. Because <laughs> you can all agree that we don't like the other side. And there's not a whole lot further to go than that. You're not making any tough choices. But once you have to start to make the tough choices in the negotiation, that's when you start to see disagreements. And that's what we're seeing now. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Eventually, it's, this agreement is going to have to be inclusive. Yeah. It's going to have to be inclusive of uh, all the stakeholders in it now. Uh, but not everybody's going to be happy. It's always the case where you're going to have a, some disgruntled elements. So, how long will this is the we're, we're committed to the end. We're here for the long haul. Okay. Yeah. I don't. We never came in with the idea that we're here for a one-year program or a two-year program and then we move on and we've done our job. No, I, I mean, we're, we're, I think that the agreement is only one step, but the implementation of that agreement is going to be just as important, and frankly, it'll probably be just as difficult, because people are going to have very high expectations a year after any agreement. People are going to start saying, well, what's changed for me? And for some people, it might have changed a bit. For some people, it might not have changed at all. And so it'll be challenging to try to make sure that people remain committed to the agreement, even though there's going to be challenges. And Mindanao's problems are, are manifold and, and uh, are very complicated in regards to issues like development and governance and these things. Those things take a long time to really show demonstrable progress on. So uh, there's going to need to be a lot of effort. The, the positive response of the community is very evident. And uh, how welcome to the thing well, sure. I think that you know, we've seen various efforts by the government at both the negotiation level, in the sense that the chairman, uh, the president met with Chairman Al-Haj Murad in Japan, so clearly politically at that level, and the negotiations that they've been engaged in. And obviously, in that proposal, a lot of hard work and thinking went into that. Um, and then on the local level, we've seen a lot of movement in regards to security. Obviously, the peace process does have privacy among the military, and um, we've seen uh, certainly the development initiatives and others starting to go ahead. I think Mindanao is at the top of this administration's agenda, and they have demonstrated that. Yes, and uh, they are part of the solution. Exactly, and they are the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I have a question from uh, here, uh, asking uh, how do you find the uh, area in this situation here? I do. I feel very, very comfortable. I, 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 get an, I get enormous support from people. I feel very secure because of that. Um, you know, we have had really no, no, no problems since we've been down uh, working in Sulu. We, we've had an expatriate down there. We had one for a couple of years. I was based down there for, for some time. So, you know, we've never had an actual incident. Uh, we've had some threats and such. So we to exercise caution, that's for sure. But generally, the, the welcome that we've received from people and support has made us feel very secure in many ways. How young am I now? Well, that's their guess. No, no, all these secrets will come out later on in the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you are better than of course. Uh, yes, I am. So, of uh, Switzerland, share a lot of experiences. Mm -hmm. see it here. Sure. Switzerland has a lot of experiences. They've got How do they see this? How do they well, they see the thing. See the Philippines. Well, I think it's two different things because I think they see Mindanao as a 
area that's very complicated and been racked by conflict. And of course, unfortunately, the headlines is always about kidnapping. So that's the fear and the perception. That's, that's the fear and perception of Manila. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's for your son. What is it is like? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's about the same fears and, and perceptions that you have of American cities, for example, which are always, you know, uh, much there's much more depth to it, complexity to it than is in a short story or the newspaper or the incident that happened. And the same is the case with with Mindanao. It's been a beautiful area. It's been a very safe area. Many, many beautiful areas, and huge amounts of potential. So, yeah, but I think that probably the international community unfortunately sees Midtown more through that lens of terrorism, which is really a perception that will need to be overcome, and that's going to take time. Uh, are we looking for words here? Are we for it? No, 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 far from it. No, I just came back from Libya, so, uh, where I spent the last several months. Really the better part of the last five months. And um, don't believe me, Mindanao actually has an enormous, and Mindanaoans have an enormous amount of potential. I mean, look at you, you're, you're a Christian, right? You know, you sit here with Muslims. I mean, in many parts of the world, the world this is not possible. You know, it just doesn't help happen that smoothly. And then you look at that, you just take that as one small example, that's huge. Look at the role of women. They play a very important role here. It's very, very positive. There's a long ways to go on that, but nonetheless. Um, you look at uh, the respect for minority rights. You look at the respect for human rights. Um, you know, th these things, they're all huge challenges. There's no question about it. And the problems with governance and development and uh, economic growth and security have all hindered the true potential of this region. And it's amazing to think what I've said in the sense of how the people are compared to how the institutions might be. <laughs> there's huge potential here, huge more, potential, and I wish more I could. I wish I could convince private investors to come down. I'm not a private investor, and you would never want to take investment advice from me. Um, but nonetheless, I always wish I, I could convince more of them to come down and invest in these communities because I think there's a lot to offer. So is it good advice? Hmm? What? <laughs> it's good advice. Yeah. So. Maybe, maybe for your parting shots, and uh, thank you for doing much more. Tell us, say us more. Well, should, that I think shots. people should be realistic in their expectations about what's going to happen with any agreement, but I think that they also have to recognize that it is up to them. There's no question about that. This process, this agreement that when it happens, um, the initiatives that are going to follow from that, they're all going to help. But at the end of the day, it is going to take the Mindanaoans. And I know that's very glib and very cliche, but it's true. And, and we've seen that. And the potential is eating the people. There's no question about it. It's amazing. I mean, I wish we could bring back all those Mindanaoans that have been living abroad, working abroad, and have a focus on Mindanao. I, I think that uh, would change. And I, and I think we do see it. I'm very hopeful. Very hopeful. And the uh, bottom line is dialogue. Bottom line is dialogue. People need to engage. There's the formal level that people engage in, in government, and so on and so forth. But perhaps more importantly is the informal ways that people engage with each other. The norms, the, the customs, the uh, ways that they, they address the issues that they have with each other. You just can't rely on the formal institutions that take care of all that in any institute, in any society just the same in Mindanao. It's going to require the people themselves to start to, to trust each other and to work together. It should be a concerted effort. It needs to be a concerted effort and it can be a very local effort. It can start small. <laughs> very big at heart. Thank you very much for the time. There we have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The days come easy and the moments pass slow And each road leads you where you want to go And if you're faced with a choice and you have to choose I hope you choose the one that means the most to you And if one door